So it's my great pleasure to have David Mackay here today. David um, is in the Department of Physics at the University of Cambridge um, and studied natural sciences at Cambridge. He got his PhD at Caltech in computation and neural systems in 1991. Um, was, was a bit of a, an activist at Caltech at the time, at least for Caltech. Uh, he founded the Caltech Environmental Task Force and uh, uh, was a involved in a variety of things in Southern California. Um, is a fellow of the Royal Society and a uh, number of other distinguished um, things. But one of the things that really uh, um, I think is so special about David is that he has successfully written a book for the, for the broad public audience um, about the challenges of renewable energy that really, I think, interprets a lot of the science and technology very successfully for people who don't have a very strong scientific background. It, this book is called uh, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. It was published in 2008, and it's available free via download. Is that right? Um, and so it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Recently, he was appointed the uh, scientific advisor to the Department of Energy and Climate Change. And in that sense, he's actually on a complex coast to coast and back again U.S. tour discussing some of the challenging issues that his office is dealing with um, in that context. So please join me in welcoming David Mackay to Cambridge, or to <laughs> our Cambridge. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. This is a talk about visualizing life without fossil fuels. We have an addiction to fossil fuels and it's not sustainable. When I say we, I'm talking about the so-called developed world. The developed world gets 80 or 90 percent of all its energy from fossil fuels, and living on fossil fuels for energy in this way is not sustainable for three fairly obvious reasons. First on the left, easily accessible fossil fuels are a finite resource, and so at some point that resource will be exploited and humanity will have to do something else. Second, Setting fire to fossil fuels puts carbon dioxide upstairs, so we have the climate motivation. The clear consensus of the climate science community is with substantial error bars still on exactly what might happen. Their advice is this is a geoengineering experiment that we're well advised to stop as soon as possible. And third, even if you don't believe in climate change and even if uh, global fossil fuels aren't running out today. It might be the case that your fossil fuels or our fossil fuels uh, in a particular country or state have run out and you might have to depend on other countries or states for fossil fuels in the future. So you have a security of supply motivation for saying let's look into really getting off fossil fuels in a serious way. I find all three of these motivations uh, equally compelling and I'm just going to take it as given now that we are interested in, a, 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 in discussing life after fossil fuels. So everyone um, gets rather emotional when we uh, get into this topic of what to do about our energy system. And when I wrote my book about sustainable energy, I was trying to help. I, I'm sure emotions are important, but we also need facts and numbers. And I tried to write a book that would be agreed by uh, everyone as having useful numbers, approximate numbers for constructive conversations about energy options. The point is it's not actually going to be easy to, uh, to get off fossil fuels. So I'd like to offer you a, a rough guide to sustainable energy with deliberately inaccurate numbers, deliberately inaccurate so as to make them easy to remember. I'm going to try and avoid talking about any numbers that come in millions, billions, or trillions because I think uh, few people actually understand the difference between those sort of quantities. Even thousands are just very big. So let's do our calculations per person, and I suggest uh, these units for discussing energy, kilowatt hours. Your electricity meter at home reads in kilowatt hours, I suspect, and maybe your utility bills come in kilowatt hours. And many everyday choices that you make come in small numbers of kilowatt hours. That's why I like it as a unit. It means the answers will come out in threes, fives, tens, and fifties. If you switch a 40 watt light bulb on for 24 hours, you use one kilowatt hour of electricity, and maybe it costs you 10 or 15 cents. If you eat food, the chemical energy in the food you eat amounts to about three kilowatt hours per day. If you take one hot bath, the heat energy in the bath is five kilowatt hours. If you take a liter of petrol and set fire to it, that dissipates 10 kilowatt hours of chemical energy. If you have a Coke habit and you drink Coke and throw away Coke cans, the embodied energy, the energy required to make the aluminum in that can that is so easy to throw away, 
is about two-thirds of a kilowatt hour. So there's some everyday choices that come in on uh, one or two hands worth of kilowatt hours. Uh, other choices involve larger numbers of kilowatt hours. If you drive an average European car 100 kilometers, you use 80 kilowatt hours. If you make the decision to make a return trip between continents, say from London to Los Angeles and back, then you use an incomprehensible number, 10,000 kilowatt hours. That's the passenger's energy footprint for that single decision. To make it comparable with other things, let's talk about how fast we use energy and describe energy use per day. If you go to London and Los Angeles, from London to Los Angeles once per year, your average rate of using energy for flying is 26 kilowatt hours per day. So that's back in the same ballpark as the 80 kilowatt hours per day for the person who decides to drive 100 kilometers every day. Similarly, running a house, we can express in kilowatt hours per day how fast we're using energy. This North American house uses 80 kilowatt hours per day of electricity. Uh, running the cat in the front garden um, there uh, requires an extra two or three kilowatt hours to, of chemical energy. And other examples of things that use energy can all be expressed in the same units. Here's a, a poster from a London uh, campaign to raise awareness of saving the planet by small lifestyle changes. And you can see unplugging your phone charger is recommended as one of the seven things that people should be paying attention to. If every London household unplugged their cell phone chargers when not in use, we would save 31,000 tons of CO2 and millions of pounds per year. So here we have thousands and millions. Clearly, these planet-destroying black objects are about as evil as Darth Vader. And so let's just pin down the numbers in a single set of units. The energy saved by the feet of switching off the phone charger for an entire day is, well, the, the phone charger is dissipating a half a watt, in fact. So you add it up for a whole day. The energy saved is the same as the energy used in driving an average car for one second. Both of them are equal to 0.01 kilowatt hours. Now, I'm not saying don't switch off the cell phone charger. Do switch it off. It will save you um, a dollar or a pound uh, a year. But is this the number one thing we should be talking about? Or is it in the top seven things we should be recommending to people? Uh, I suspect it really deserves to fall low down the list of priorities. And we need to improve our public communications to get people to prioritize actions that really make a difference. So these are examples of energy consumption choices we can make. When we look up national statistics and divide the total energy consumption by the number of people in the country, we find for a typical European country like Britain that the consumption is 125 kilowatt hours per day per person. And that's also the European average energy consumption. You can visualize this in various ways. One way is this is like every European having 125 light bulbs on all the time. That's the same as the modern... Europeans' energy consumption. Americans use, on average, taking the entire energy consumption, sharing it between 300 million people, 250 light bulbs each, 250 kilowatt hours per day per person. Where's this going? Well, in Britain, it's going into transport, heating, especially hot air for buildings, uh, and also hot water, and other stuff, much of it being electrical uh, consumption. So for a quick conversation of where does the energy go, what can we do about it, transport, heating, electricity are the top three things to consider. When we talk about getting off fossil fuels, one of the prominent options is renewable power sources. And when we discuss those, most renewables involve doing something on a piece of land or possibly a piece of sea. And we need to talk about how much power you can gather per unit area from those. And the units in which I'm going to measure powers per unit area are going to be watts per square meter. Uh, incidentally, you, you will have already noticed I'm measuring power, which is how fast we use energy in kilowatt hours per day. One kilowatt hour per day, remember, is the same as one 40 watt light bulb. And the physicists and engineers in the audience will be spitting at this point and saying, why do, is he using kilowatt hours per day? What an ugly, horrible unit. Why doesn't he just use watts? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is the watt is too small and the kilowatt is too big a unit for the answer to come out in fives, tens, and twenties. And Secondly, I think people don't understand watts. If I tell you the average European uses five kilowatts, I think many people might say, is that kilowatts per month or per year? So people don't actually know that a watt has got the per time built into it. By saying kilowatt hours per day, yes, it's ugly, but it has the, the time explicitly there. So people understand we're talking about a rate. But for powers per unit area, I'm going to use the SI unit, watts per square meter. 
We need to talk about population densities as well because um, we need to know how much area each person has to harvest renewables from if we want renewables to make a substantial contribution. And the population density of the UK is 250 people per square kilometre. The population density of Massachusetts is also 250 people per square kilometre. So everything I say about the UK applies to Massachusetts as, as well, if we're trying to visualize life without fossil fuels for a state like Massachusetts. The population density of the USA as a whole is significantly lower. Um, so the answers depend on which uh, contiguous region, which uh, country or state uh, we're talking about, what the visualizing of life without fossil fuels will actually look like. For Massachusetts and for Britain, the area per person is 4,000 square meters. That's the area of half of a premiership football field for each person. So let's now look at a map of the world. This is a map of the world where the horizontal axis is showing population density, which I just mentioned. For Britain, it's 250 people per square kilometer. And energy consumption per person is on the vertical axis. And that's 125 light bulbs per person for Britain. This map shows European countries over hereabouts. Um, and African countries are in blue down here. And up in the top left, we have countries with very low population density, Iceland, Canada, Australia, but very high per capita consumptions up in the 200 or 300 light bulbs per person area. Um, the, both of these scales are logarithmic. So as I go from this line to this line, it's a tenfold increase in population density. And the same when we go up to here, another factor of 10. So Bahrain's population density is more than 100 times greater than that of Iceland, but its energy consumption per person is just the same. Coming back down here, we go down two factors of 10 in energy consumption to Bangladesh, where people just use three kilowatt hours per day per person, and they have the same population density as Bahrain. Over in the bottom left, there used to be countries over here, but they're all rushing up and to the right to come and join us in the top right-hand side of this diagram. This next rendering shows you uh, a few tails behind showing progress. This is 15 years of progress from 1990 to 2005. Every country has a population density that's increasing and an energy consumption that's increasing. They're all going up and to the right. This is the world average moving up and to the right, just crossing over 0.1 watts per square meter. What are these purple lines? Well, the advantage of using uh, logarithmic scales for these two diagrams is if you multiply the energy consumption per person by the population density, you get the power consumption per unit area of the country that we're talking about. All of the countries on this line here are using 0.1 watts per square meter. That's their power consumption per unit area. That's the world average. It's the same for Jordan, for Saudi Arabia, and it was the same for Bangladesh in 1990. The UK has a higher population density and higher per capita consumption than the world average, and it's using 1.25 watts per square meter. Here's America with higher per capita consumption, lower population density at something like 0.3 watts per square meter. Why is this useful? Well, as I said earlier, renewables, many of them have a power per unit area as well, and we can put that into exactly the same units so we can understand the scale of what's involved if we want to visualize a renewable-dominated future or a future in which renewables make a significant contribution. What I've done between these two pictures here and here is I've shrunk the diagram down a little bit to the left, and I've added some green lines. So now Bahrain is in the top right over here, and we have lines showing the power per unit area of various renewables. Wind power, for example, delivers in a windy location roughly 2.5 watts per square meter, which is twice the power per unit area that Britain is currently consuming. So the message from this is if half of Britain were occupied by wind farms, then the output of those wind farms on average would equal our average power consumption. And some people might view that as a slightly intrusive uh, change to the countryside of Britain. And uh, Massachusetts, we have the, the same uh, rough message that if half of Massachusetts were occupied by wind farms, that um, a set of devices would um, match. It's not windy enough. And maybe it's not windy enough, and maybe the per capita consumption is slightly higher, so actually maybe you need slightly more than half of Massachusetts occupied by, by wind farms, or an area in a windy location uh, similar to the area of Massachusetts. 